scalping. That was the Caucasians' way of doing things. They scalped my people because they could get money for it, a bounty, a hundred dollars for a brave's scalp, fifty dollars for a woman's scalp, twenty-five dollars for a young person. We didn't start scalping, but they put that blame on us. They say that. Now you gotta realize, like, why did they scalp? And you must be thinking, man, this guy is straight paranoid. This guy is indoctrinated. But my ancestors in Polynesia, in Hawaii, even till today, have Afros. So if the people on the other side of America had Afros, and they were sending people to the to the continent that connects to it with the land bridge, right? There's a land bridge that connects to uh, Rapa Nui, Easter Island, and there's a land bridge that connects to uh, Hawaii, around Hawaii area, right? And the water is lower, and this land bridge is, is you can see it from the sky, but it's, you can see it more when the water is lower, okay? So if they send people to this land mass in between the Polynesians and where they're coming from, and they're, and they're saying that, oh, you can give you hundred dollars for take off their head and keep their hair intact. Why? Well, verification, right? Though when you see movies about people who sending um, assassins after people, right? They say, "What? Well, bring me his finger. Bring me his hand. Bring me his ear. Bring me his eyes, so I know that I can I can verify that you killed that person, right? Right? Oh, bring me his heart." You see movies where they kill them, they kill an animal, they bring the animal's heart and say, here's his heart. Here, because they never like kill the guy. Right? So that's why. This is why this is so important. It wasn't because, oh, they just, they love the, the, the way this, this other person's straight hair looks and they just want to, no, they wanted to ensure they knew that there was different types of Indians. Indios, because they're never calling us Indians, they call us Indios, God's people. But they know that there's different types of people. And what they wanted to do was take out the, the leaders, the infrastructure, and the chiefs. So they went after all of the springy to wooly people. All these leaders, all these, and they wanted to make sure that the people that they was utilizing these warriors to their full extent by having this hair to prove that they weren't just killing people that this money we're giving to them is justified because of the ends we want these people to be uh, marginalized we have to take them out we have to take out their leaders and we have to re-educate them that's what this is all about. We broke it, treaty. And if you look right here, it's Indian country today, Indian country uh, media network, right? And if you read, it says, from the events in Indian history, courtesy of Pennsylvania. Right, you see that? These are more whitewashed images. These are Afro people, and they're just beating them up in the streets. I, I remember watching a lecture about this. Courtesy Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. In this 1841 print of Paxton Boys Massacre, the artist put the Paxton Boys in 19th century dress. He did, however, capture the horrible violence of the episode when an armed mob a hacked to death a party of unarmed Indian men, women, and children okay so now we get to scalping in America and it says when when and where did scalping in America begin scalping has long been a sensitive topic in the history of this country the books newspapers magazines and films about Indians have almost always said Indians scalp their victims, but 
but almost never did the White Scalp Indians. The opposite is true. Both sides killed and scalped each other. After digging into it for my next book, Indian Massacres in the U.S., I have found something much closer to the truth. Both Indians and whites scalped each other, but whites got paid for it. Why would they pay the white people to scalp? Because we want to verify the heritage. Whites also did it to help the colonial legislator achieve their goal to exterminate all Indians. What did they do after? They had um, constables come to your your um, tribe and anybody who was Afro, they would take them, right? All these Indians who, who are Indians tell her this. They say, yep, they were always coming. We had to pretend we weren't black. We had to say, no, we're just Indian. Because if we if they knew we were black, if they knew you were black, they would take you, right? Scalping was over two thousand years old in Europe, so this is so this is the basis of it. Okay, they, this is what happened. We didn't break no trees because we made them under the pretense of having our creator to listen in to know what was happening. That's why we smoked the pipe. They call it the peace pipe. But we pray to our Creator in a very special way. We smoke a pipe. We don't inhale the tobacco. The prayers that we want to be heard are in that smoke, and when they rise, they go to the Creator. Why don't they want you to smoke marijuana? Why? Why is it a class one villain? Why do they promote all these other drugs, but they hate marijuana? Is it because it makes you think? Is it because it makes you have this connection to the creator? Does it, is it a pathway, the smoke a pathway for prayers? Is that why the new movement is don't smoke it, eat it now? Right? Because maybe the smoke the smoke has something to it. When the smoke rises, it holds your prayers, your thoughts, your moral, your morality, and it gives it and it shows it. Is that is that why? Let me show you something. Alright, so when you look in the Bible. When, when you look at the word cannabis, they had uh, traced it to a, a culture. But what they, re they realized is it actually comes from an older root word, which is Semitic, and it's cannabosum. called cannabasum right cannabis and in the bible prior to the european changing of it this was part of the mixture of the sacred herb and the sacred um, incense and this is what would help you speak and be guided by the creator and the oils and all of this stuff that we're discovering today are medicines. How we're discovering that we have a, a cannab cannabinoid receptors in us, and built in us to process this. So here we go. Cannabis in the Old Testament. Now you see how it says the Old Testament. You see how the New Testament, you see how the Old Testament is called scriptures. You see how the New Testament is called Gospels. You see how when they teach you about the New Testament, they always say Scripture. But then they got to correct themselves and say the Gospels. Right? Gospels, Evangelists, Good News of Military Victory. Where they talk about the defeat of our ancestors. Who is the good news about? So let's get into it. 
Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit. And that's from Genesis 1, 29 to 30. And I must realize that when you were a child, you used to eat watermelons. Watermelons was amazing. They had the black fruit, the black seeds. And it was the juiciest thing, man. You, but it took you forever to spit out all these seeds. You used to get irritated. You, it was so bad that you was like a professional seed remover out of watermelon. Yeah. You got so good at it because that's what you do. You, you analyze stuff and you try to do, get better and better at it because you're so competitive. And plus you love fruit so you just wanted to eat and eat eat it fast. This, this is, you, you eat all these different genetically mutated foods today that taste like crap. That make you want the synthetic food, right? But once they, when now there's no seeds like it used to be, the watermelons got white seeds or no seeds. So you must realize that created created things perfectly for you to feed you, feed the energy you needed to survive and thrive. And that's what they do. They, they destroy those things that help you and keep you from those things that give you the connection and increase your health. So let's get into it. Those words seem straightforward enough. And yet cannabis and most other psychoactive medicine plants are outlawed in our society. Those who use these plant gateways to other states of consciousness are jailed for doing so. Ironically, the major force for continuing this plant prohibition is a group referred to as the Christian right. Now you understand, look at this. We're all leading back to the Christians. Yeah? They believe in the Bible, yet all this is in the Old Testament. But they're explicitly keeping you away from it to keep you under that illusion right they claim to believe in both the bible and we can see through etymology that yahweh goes back to an older root version of haya and they also try to inject hawa okay now that's why Hawaii's name, Hawaii. Yet Yahweh's opinion on the matter is stated quite clear, clearly in the above quotation. The article shows that how the Old Testament prophets were none other than ancient shamans, and that cannabis and other enthe entheogens played very prominent roles in ancient Hebrew culture. The roots of cannabis. Now you see how spiritual the shamans are, right? In India, right? And we know that Jerusalem was priested by another people group before. And we know he had other cultures as his servants before, right? Them, but they strayed far and he made another choice. But what do the shamans do? The shamans smoke marijuana and they say this gives them the connection to the creator. <clears throat> the first solid evidence of the Hebrew use of cannabis was established in 1936 by Sula Bennett. A little known Polish etymologist from the Institute of Anthropology, Science in Warsaw. The word cannabis was generally thought to be Scythian origin, but Bennett shows that its much earlier origin in Semitic languages like Hebrew that appears several times throughout the Old Testament. Bennett explains that in the original Hebrew text of the Old Testament, there are references to hemp both as incense, which was an integral part of religious celebration as an intoxicant. Bennett demonstrated that the word for cannabis is cannabosum, also rendered in traditional Hebrew as kana or cannabis, the root khan. Now we understand that khan has a great place in the Hebrew culture, 
We were called the Grand Khans. There was all type of um, uh, there's a in the Grand Canyon. There's a statue to the Khan, the Grand Khan. It's a constructive word means reed or hemp. While bosom means aromatic, this word appears five times in the Old Testament. In the books of Exodus, the Song of Songs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, the word cannabasum has been mistranslated as cannabis, a common marsh plant with little monetary value that does not have the qualities or value ascribed to cannabasum. The error occurred in the oldest Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint. Now we hear the Greek, the Coptics, the, the, um, them and the Romans against people who use cannabisum. So they mistranslated. So those people don't have the, the knowledge to perform specific rituals. In the 3rd century BC and was repeated in many translations that followed. The hidden story when we take a chronological look at biblical references to cannabis, we reveal more than just the story of cannabis in the Old Testament. Another exciting and concealed story emerging as well, that of the suppression of the worship of Astarte, also called Asherah, known as the ancient Semitics, Semites as the Queen of Heaven, who they worship in Hawaii, which I believe may be, the, may be a reference to Hawa, Queen of Heaven. What did they call the city that they had for the Queen of Heaven? Hawatha. Hamamba was another name for her. So we had to research and see what this leads us to, but Basically, we're not out for those cookies. We're out here to see cannabis and how it relates to Native Americans and their rituals of peace pipes. What do you do? What happens when you and, and someone maybe you don't like too much or have palm frictions with and you smoke? Huh? What happens? Right? Uh, there's a little, there's a peace that goes on. There's like, and they call it peace pipe, right? Right? Doesn't something happen and it's all good now? It's a peace pipe. Right? What does the feeling make you? Does it make you want to go to war? Or does it make you want to negotiate and find common ground? That's how the relationship is to the, us, the American culture. The first mention of cannabis in the Old Testament appears with the prophet um, Moses. At the beginning of his shamanic career, Moses discovered the angel of the Lord in flames of fire within the bush. So it's going to go deep into it, but I'm, I'm not here for it. I'm, I'm here to show you that you it's more to this story. It's not just a fairy tale story that never happened. There's so much in here that shows us the aboriginals of America. That's why we, tobacco is a sacred herb among my people. We don't do it for relaxation, for, we don't get diseases from it. You know, I have uh, two brothers and a sister. And none of us have diabetes. None of us are sick in any way, overweight or anything. We're all in good health. We're all in our 70s. And we all get around and do the things that we need to do. We want people to know who we are and to admit. And you see how you're talking about um, the tobacco. If you look at uh, this this latest post from Brother uh, Reginald Parkinson, <laughs> you see, uh, stuff that in your pipe and smoke it. The original American entrepreneurs, a spark from Sister Alfreda Gilmore. All right, Alfreda stated, "Wow, I had a similar discussion with a friend, and this is things that I thought about as well." You know what I mean? A couple of months back, we both believed that they renamed. 
did the history of our thriving cannabis weed herb industry right now we understand that if you um through weed you can create hemp you can create thousands of different products that's the true industry that's why we are thriving in the way we were into what we know think now what we now think of as the tobacco industry Indian statues tobacco Indian statues right one being the tobacco Indian statues wearing tobacco skirts was more than likely the cannabis Indians compared to tobacco cannabis herbs grows faster have more medicinal properties and other benefits that tobacco doesn't have my response you must have been reading my mind I had the same epiphany when I realized that the crowns and skirts or kilts were tobacco leaves now one has to only use common sense to ascertain that if at, if the ancestors were adding adorning themselves in fresh green tobacco leaves and this was a resource that was used for clothing tobacco has to be dried and cured before consumed air cured tobacco is hung in well ventilated barns and allowed to dry over a period of four to eight weeks air cured tobacco is low in sugar which gives the tobacco smoke a light sweet flavor and a high nicotine content cigar and burly tobaccos are air cured Virginia tobacco is sun cured. Sun curing tobacco leaves are strung out on racks and exposed to the sun for 12 to 30 days. The sun's direct heat fixes the leaves at a yellow to orange color with a high sugar content. Curing marijuana is a slow process that lasts as long as the grower desires. The average range is about one to two weeks again. However, some connoisseurs cono <laughs> <laughs> connoisseurs deploy much lengthier cures with some lasting as long as a few months oh my gosh so knowing the process of curing both tobacco and marijuana to be consumed wouldn't it be more plausible to conclude that both were used that both were used in the bowl pipes that were carved by the ancestors and isn't that true, right? What do we know with Bob Marley? We all was raised by Bob Marley, Africa, Africa, right? Bob Marley smoked spliffs. We don't realize what spliffs was. Spliffs was tobacco and cannabis. So would our ancestors do this as well? Or maybe, and, and apart from each other, whatever? Do people who smoke weed and smoke cigarettes today refrain from smoking one or the other? No, they, they partake in both, right? And considering that fresh tobacco leaves were worn even after.